Welcome to Plant It and They Will Come, Planting for Pollinators, presented by the Master Gardeners of Placer County. We've got a beautiful morning to be out working in the garden, and I'm so glad you are all here to see Planting for Pollinators. My name is Becky Fritchie, and I'm going to be your moderator today. As you saw in the opening slides, this workshop is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube site after it's been uploaded. The link to the video and any accompanying resources can be accessed from our website, which is pcmg.ucanr.org. If you have questions during the presentation, you can post them through the chat menu, and we will ask our presenter to address them at the end of the presentation. Take it away, TC. Good morning. My name is TC Markle and I've been a master gardener since 2013. I'm talking to you today about creating habitat for pollinators because it has become a passion of mine. Over time as a gardener, I have developed a huge interest in bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds and learning what to plant to attract them to my yard. It is still a thrill to see who comes to visit and truly illustrates that if you plant it, they will come. Let me start my presentation here. Hmm. Does that look all right? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, looks good, TC. Okay. Uh, first of all, let's talk about who are master gardeners. We uh, are volunteers who extend research-based sustainable gardening and composting information to home gardeners and encourage them to make informed gardening decisions with that information. Where can we be found? You can call us at hotline. There's the number or you can submit your questions online. And there's the website address. We also have uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram postings. You can see us in Gold Country Media monthly columns and various newspapers. We have a monthly online Curious Gardener newsletter on our website. And we sell a gardening guide and calendar every year. We are also found in non-COVID times at workshops, fairs and festivals, and special events like our garden fair, which is every April, and our Mother's Day garden tour, which we look forward to returning next year. Here is our main page on our website, and I'd like to point out a few things. After this recording, has been made and you want, if you want to watch it again to pick up any tips, you don't need to worry about taking notes today. You can just go here where it says recorded virtual gardening workshops and click on that in a few days, you'll be able to watch it again if you'd like to. Then up on the uh, top here, I'd like to show you this um, menu up here. And if you go to landscape plants, there's a drop down there and um, there's a section where you can read about California native plants and pollinator resources. And then over here on the left is where you can sign up for the Curious Gardener newsletter. Just click on that and it'll ask you to register for that. Okay, here's our agenda. Who are pollinators? So right now I want you to think of as many pollinators as you can and I will reveal who they are momentarily. We will also uh, answer the question, why do we need pollinators? What is pollinator habitat? How can I attract pollinators? And lots of plants. So here are the pollinators. We have bees, lots of bees. That's honeybee there, but there are many more that we'll learn about today. Butterflies, wasps, moths, beetles, flies, birds, Bats, wind, and even humans are all pollinators. Now bats, 
do not pollinate here locally, but they do in the desert. And wind accounts for about 13% of pollination. If you are a person who suffers from allergies, you will know about this because there certain plants are, have wind driven pollen like oaks, pines and olive trees. Most folks are familiar with honeybees, but may be surprised to hear that they are European imports brought by the early settlers to our country. People have heard of the difficulties honeybees are experiencing with colony collapse disorder. On the right side, we see the other guys. These are the native bees, which also provide pollinator services and are often very specialized in their work and sometimes even more efficient than honeybees. In California, we have 1,600 native bee species from minute one eight inch long bees to the largest, which is the carpenter bee at over one inch long. It is estimated that these native bees provide 35 to 38% of pollination services required by California crops. Bumblebees are easily recognized by their mostly black hairs with contrasting stripes of yellow, red, or white hairs. Valley carpenter bee is our largest bee. Females are black and shiny. Here on the upper right, you can see a male known as the teddy bear bee. He has green eyes and golden brown hair. Cuckoo bees make up 15% of the world's bee species. They make their living by stealing painstakingly constructed nests and hard-won provisions from other bees. Some of them can be confused for wasps, like this one on the lower right, because they have little body hair and they have similar markings to wasps. Digger bees are ground nesters, as their name implies. Ground nesting bees make up 70% of California native bees. They usually need direct access to the soil surface to excavate and access their nests. The top two photos are digger bees, which are generally gray in color. They are solitary and nest in the ground. On the lower left is a female sweat bee emerging from her underground nests. Here in the last photo, note the size of these two emerging sweat bees compared to the size of this penny. Approximately 30% of native bees are tunnel or cavity nesters. These bees may use abandoned beetle tunnels in stumps or tree snags. A few chew out the soft pithy centers of some plant stems and twigs. This leaf cutter bee cuts a perfect circle from a soft leaf like this redbud leaf on the lower right. They will often use rose leaves. Count yourself fortunate if you see these cutouts as then you know a leaf cutter bee has chosen your yard to raise her young. She cuts the leaf to line the cavity she finds. Then she deposits pollen and nectar and lays a single egg on it, then caps off the brood cell with another piece of leaf and continues to fill more chambers. She caps off the end and her job is done. Caterpillars are the preferred choice of birds raising their young. Caterpillars make perfect baby food as they are like soft bags filled with food. It would take 200 aphids to equal the weight of one medium sized caterpillar. A single pair of breeding chickadees must find 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to rear one clutch of young, according to Doug Tallamy a professor of entomology and wildlife ecology at the University of Delaware. He says this, our nearly universal animosity towards insects is understandable, but seriously misplaced. Of the 9 million or so insect species on earth, a mere 1% interact with humans in negative ways. The other 99% of the insect species pollinate plants, return the nutrients tied up in dead plants and animals to the soil, keep populations of insect herbivores in check, aerate and enrich the soil, and as I keep stressing, provide food either directly or indirectly for most other animals. Doug Tallamy wrote this statement in his book, Bringing Nature Home, 
how native plants sustain wildlife in our gardens. Pollinators provide pollination services for 75% of agricultural crops and for 90% of flowering perennials. They are responsible for one of every three bites of food we take in. This tiny chocolate midge on the bottom is responsible for all of the world's chocolate production. These two pictures were photographed at a Whole Foods market. The first shows a typical produce department. The second photo was taken after the produce team pulled 237 out of 453 products that need pollination services. Among the removed items were apples, onions, avocados, carrots, mangoes, lemons, limes, honeydew, cantaloupe, zucchini, summer squash, eggplant, cucumber, celery, green onions, cauliflower, leeks, bok choy, kale, broccoli, and mustard greens, just to name a few. We would be missing out if we didn't have pollinators to help with this food production. Let's think like a pollinator for a moment. This photo looks wild and weedy, but there is a lot going on here that is beneficial. Large swaths of flowers attract pollinators. Those oak trees are food for many varieties of moth and butterfly caterpillars. Those grasses may just look like weeds, but some of those are larval host food for moths and butterflies too. Notice the layers, bare soil for nesting bees and trees with mid-story and upper canopy layers for shelter. A high diversity of plants is needed to attract a variety of pollinators. If we look at these yards, there aren't many flowers or diversity. The lawn does not provide shelter or food. In fact, there may be, have been pesticides and herbicides used here that could be harmful to pollinators. Compare the previous photos to these two in this slide and notice the huge variety of plants with various flower types, the layers where pollinators can mate and raise their young and can find safe hiding places to rest. A healthy habitat needs to include food for adult pollinators. Nectar provides carbohydrates for flight fuel. Pollen provides protein, vitamins, minerals, and fats. Both pollen and nectar are needed to feed bee offspring. Plants also provide food for young in the form of larval host plants for caterpillars. We'll talk more about that later. The pollen and nectar that constitute a bee's diet don't contain much moisture, so bees must have a water source. Bees need shallow, safe landing spots to prevent drowning. Add gravel and rocks to offer them a safe drinking place. In larger bird baths, water should only be several inches deep. You may provide floating pieces of cork for bee rescue. Butterflies prefer wet sand or mud for puddling, which offers minerals especially important for healthy reproduction. Here I mix sand and compost with water and add a few rocks for sunning. Oh, FYI, that dirty water refers to water containing nutrients, so it's okay to leave wet leaves and algae sit in your bee water source. Minerals leach from them into the water. Be sure to dump the water every three to five days to discourage mosquitoes from laying eggs, but you don't need to scrub or disinfect the dish. To support pollinators, we need to plant in layers from the tree canopy, understory, shrubs, herbaceous plants, and finally ground cover. These layers provide shelter from predators and weather extremes. Think 3D, says Doug Talamy, and in fact, maybe think 4D, since by designing your landscape in all three dimensions, layering plants into a complex communities, you'll add the D of diversity too. Leaving some wild areas will provide for butterfly pupation sites. Important features to include are bare soil, as 70% of native bees are ground nesters. Leave leaf litter under trees. Many moth and butterfly caterpillars drop to the ground to pupate in the soil or roll up in leaves. Brush piles and hollow stems are also great locations for pollination nesting sites. It's important not to be too neat. 
Small clumps of grass, weeds, or debris left under shrubs can protect a bumblebee queen as she overwinters in her underground nest. Another important aspect is to retain dead tree branches known as snags. As few as 10 carefully chosen plant species will provide a good foundation. Grouping the same plants together will attract a greater number of pollinators. The size of the pollinators, the length of their tongues, and the accessibility of nectar and pollen determines the flower preferences of pollinators. Including a variety of plants with different flowers, sizes, shapes, and colors, as well as plant heights, will support the greatest numbers and diversity of pollinators. Flowers often have contrasting color marks, lines, patterns, or freckles that serve as guides to where the bee should go in the flower. These are called nectar guides. Let me describe a few flower shapes. I will be labeling the photos with common names, but later you may check the resource list that accompanies this presentation on our PCMG website for a listing of the botanical names which help when purchasing plants. You may also view this talk again via our YouTube channel. If you see a flower that has a number of short flower stalks which spread from a common point ending in tiny flowers, this is known as an umbel. This is characteristic of the celery, carrot, or parsley family. Umbel kind of reminds you of the name umbrella, so that's a hint. These plants with umbel style flowers offer convenient landing pads for pollinators. The upper two on the left are native plants. The one on the right is a garden herb. This California native plant, common yarrow, is visited by a wide variety of pollinators. Just a few here left to right, we have an Eastern blue-tailed butterfly, um, a blue mud dauber, and a drone fly. Open cup-shaped flowers are easy for all bees to access. These flowers usually have a large ring of anthers in the center and you can watch bees practically swimming around the center and picking up the pollen. These flowers offer only pollen as a reward, which means they are primarily visited by bees. Here we have a grouping of California native flowers, all with open cup shapes. Notice the nectar guides on that meadow foam flower on the lower left. It tells the bee goes straight here. Next we have tubular flowers. Usually nectar is found at the bottom of these tubes. The length and width of the tube can limit which pollinator species can access the nectar. Many of these flowers are visited by moths and butterflies, which have very long tongues. Hummingbirds are frequent visitors to tubular flowers also. These two pentstemons on the left are native California native plants, and the other one is a non-native. Nectar robbing is used to access nectar when a bee with a short tongue visits a flower with a long corolla. The bee has strong mandibles or mouth parts, so it can bite a hole instead at the base of a flower. The downside is that the flower does not get pollinated by that bee. More complicated shapes of flowers, like a pea or a lupin, limit which bees can access the nectar or pollen in that plant. These flowers often require heavier, larger bees, like bumblebees for pollination. These large bees are strong enough or heavy enough to push open the flowers. These plants have flowers with lobes that act as a landing platform called a lip, where a bee can land to enter the flower. The pollen is hidden in the upper part of the flower called the keel. When the bee pushes its way into the flower to reach the nectar while standing on that lobe, the stigma and stamen pop out of the keel and pick up any pollen on the bee's back and places it in its own pollen, its own pollen on the center of the thorax of the bee. When the bee moves to the next flower, the process repeats and pollination happens. 
Flowers with a central disc, like sunflowers, are favorites of many pollinators. When you look at one of these flowers, you are actually looking at tens or hundreds of flowers. The center disc part of the flower is made up of tiny flowers, each with its own nectar and pollen. The outer flowers, which are petals, are called ray flowers and function as attraction. The seaside daisy and the gumweed are California native plants. The Mexican sunflower is a non-native annual. Many small flowers make up a compound inflorescence. Having lots of flowers combined into a single head provides a lot of nectar and pollen resources in a small area. Pollinators can visit lots of flowers in a concentrated area without expending as much energy traveling between plants. Here a painted lady butterfly sips on some toyon flowers. Within a simple inflorescence, individual flowers can open slowly over time, allowing more visitors and ideally more pollination. On the upper left, a honeybee visits the dark star, Ceanothus. Other flowers shown here are a pincushion flower, a native holly leaf cherry in bloom, and a tall verbena. Many species of wildflowers, grasses, shrubs, and trees are butterfly hosts. Caterpillars of some species will eat only a single species of plant, while others will eat a wide range of plants. Often butterflies and moths have specialized relationships with native larval host plants. For the many butterflies that are host plant specific, such as monarchs with their milkweeds, the availability of these host plants is critical to their survival. The first photo shows a blooming showy milkweed plant being visited by honeybees. The upper middle photo illustrates the tiny size of a fairly young monarch caterpillar, followed next by a large caterpillar. On the bottom row is a newly pupated jade green individual next to the dark pupa that is very close to eclosing or emerging as an adult. That is a female monarch adult on the far right. Most butterflies lay their eggs directly on host plants so that after hatching, caterpillars do not have to travel far to begin feeding. Here is an anise swallowtail egg on that ferny leaf of the fennel, followed by a photo of the caterpillar and then the adult butterfly on the right. Leaves are the primary source of caterpillar food, but they will also eat stems, flowers, and immature fruit. These photos illustrate the life cycle of the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. The California Dutchman's pipe vine is the larval host plant. From the upper left, you see the flowers, which resemble an old fashioned pipe. Then the eggs on a leaf, some of which have already hatched. You see my thumb there for size comparison. So you see how tiny those eggs are. On the bottom row, we have a caterpillar, then a pupa, attached to a stem, and finally the adult pipe vine swallowtail nectaring on the native Verbena lilicina de la Mina. In our area, we have year-round hummingbird residents in the form of Anna's hummingbirds. It is possible with careful planning to have something blooming for them all year long. Early bloomers include willows, manzanitas, California lilacs, and the ribes family, which are currants and gooseberries. Later in spring, hummers will feed on California buckeye, various sages, and penstemons. In summer, they are quite attracted to Mexican sunflower, even though it doesn't have tubular flowers. Late summer and fall bring California fuchsia, which is a hummingbird magnet. Many agastaches, also known as hummingbird mint, continue to bloom for long periods. Many culinary herbs are pollinator friendly. They're a good addition to veggie gardens as they attract pollinators where they are needed. Here we have examples of fennel, culinary sage, borage, and chamomile. Let some of the herbs begin to go, go to seed and flower so that pollinators have pollen and nectar. Rosemary is a prolific bloomer too. Let's think of our gardens as patchwork quilts. 
let's consider sequential flowering times and make it a goal to have flowers blooming in every season. Most bees exhibit floral constancy, which means they visit only one or very few types of flowers each time they go out foraging. The ideal patch size is four feet by four feet. A garden area design that features dense plantings ensures a robust food supply for pollinators. Most bees and butterflies prefer to fly in the sun, so concentrate your flower plantings there. Salvia, Bee's Bliss, is a low-growing, widespreading native sage that is attractive to pollinators. Goldenrod is a late summer, early fall bloomer that is especially attractive to migrating monarchs. Since native bees are seasonal, the plant palette chosen should reflect the changing seasons of both bees and plants. With few exceptions, most bee species are only active for a short time each year. Several plants should be blooming in each season to provide pollen and nectar to visiting bees. The main activity period for bees is February through October, so select bloom times that overlap. Annual plants keep the garden dynamic and changing with colors and flower types throughout the year. Sow seeds for these spring blooming annuals, like these three here, in late fall in order to take advantage of winter rains. You can't go wrong with Tithonia or Mexican sunflower, which anchors many pollinator gardens in California. From spring through fall, it is visited by many species of butterflies and bees. Hummingbirds love it too. A hedgerow is a mixture of trees and or flowering shrubs that typically includes an understory of grasses and nectar flowers. The plants are allowed to flower and reach full size and intertwine with each other. Hedgerows have enormous wildlife value as they offer dense cover and a diversity of seasonal food sources. Neonicotinoids are commonly used insecticides which are highly water soluble allowing the growing plants to absorb and transport the chemical to all plant tissues, all the way from roots to pollen. Pollinators may consume contaminated plant products like leaves, pollen, and nectar, and be killed if they consume a high enough dose of the chemical. The use of neonics and other pesticides is common in nurseries and plants often not, are often not labeled as treated that way when sold. So please talk to the store manager to find out if their plants have been treated. BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, kills all leaf feeding moth and caterpillars, sorry, moth and butterfly caterpillars that feed on sprayed foliage. It is a bacterium and it infects the gut of caterpillars, but it does not affect humans or beneficial insects. Check out these book resources for great info and plant lists. They are listed on the resource page, which will be available on our website within a few days. If you are not familiar with CalScape, it is the California Native Plant Society database about California native plants local to your area. Let's look at it briefly. I typed my zip code to see which plants are native to my location. It says at my location, there are 550 plants. Then I clicked up here on the top where it says butterflies at that heading and um, left my zip code in and it says I have 110 butterflies and moths native to my location. So I chose one of those butterflies, clicked on that. I chose the Western Tiger Swallowtail to see which plants are confirmed host plants. On the right here is a map showing where all those swallowtails have been sighted. So I chose one of the plants to look at and I chose the holly leaf cherry. Plant photos are shown from foliage to flowers to fruit. Underneath the photos in this green print here, it lists 45 nurseries that carry that plant, 46 rather. So if I click on that, 
I'll know where to go shopping for those plants. Scrolling down the page a little bit farther, we see other butterflies and moths that use this plant as the host right here. Then we see landscaping information such as light exposure, water and soil needs, etc. To conclude, to have a successful pollinator garden, we should provide abundance by planting in masses of a single species, plan for a long bloom season, leave some non-mulched bare soil for ground nesting bees, leave snags and logs for cavity nesters, provide a diversity of bloom types, including plants with overlapping bloom times. A diversity of blooms will attract a variety of pollinators and other insects. Time to start planning. Thank you for attending our workshop today. And now we'll see if there are any questions. Let's see. I'm not seeing any questions, TC. I think you've just provided a lot of excellent, excellent information. I love the photographs. Um, I'd like to thank TC and remind all of you that you can find the link and the handouts of this recorded workshop soon at pcmg.ucanr.org under virtual gardening workshops. And TC showed you that slide where to find it. If you look under upcoming events, you'll see the links and information to our future virtual workshops. And you can also ask gardening questions by clicking on Ask a Master Gardener. Thank you all for attending and we'll see you June 12th for our workshop on welcome to the splendid world of succulents. Thank you everybody, you have a good weekend.